Fresh. Good morning, and welcome to another fabulous episode of Fresh. I'm your host, Brenda Masson, and our technical producer is Jason Rumble. Today we'll be talking with Dr. Petra Hofseidel about Lyme disease and ticks. Do stay tuned. This will be a fascinating show. Today we're speaking with Dr. Petra Hofseidel on Fresh. Dr. Hofseidel, we are very happy to have you on Fresh today and really intrigued with this whole situation with ticks and Lyme disease. You're a neurologist and a psychiatrist, and you have spent the last 10 years researching and exploring Lyme disease, mostly from a chronic point of view, but I guess in all aspects of Lyme disease. Tell us a little bit about how it all starts with the tick. Good morning, Brenda. Thank you for the (laughs) invitation and the chance to talk about it. Well, the chronic Lyme disease is the most important one because many patients who have it are overlooked having this disease. So starting from the early stage of the disease, it's easy to recognize because 40 to 60 percent of all who get a fresh infection uh, develop a a bullseye rash. And this bullseye rash is very clear as a sign of Lyme disease infection. When you don't see erythema migrans or bullseye rash, as you call it over here, then It's not a sign that you are not infected, but it is only that you are not reacting with your skin. So it could be that you get the infection without any clinical sign on your skin. Then you have to see for us signs which are quite typical in the beginning of the disease. So this is, for example, the flu-like symptoms. You feel like getting a flu, but you don't have a running nose. You only have the pain and aches in the joints and feeling tired and crappy at all. But after a while, it takes you four days, three, four days, then you feel better and you don't realize that you are infected if you don't see this early sign as a sign of infection. So this is a very tricky thing because most doctors would recognize it as a summer flu, which is normally viral, caused by viruses, and uh, what normally doesn't need any treatment. So if you overlook this first sign of infection, then the whole story goes on with a final stage of a maybe chronic disease. Wow. So if you have the bullseye, could you have the bullseye and not have any symptoms at all? It's very unlikely. If you have the bullseye rash, then you have normally this headache and, and pain in, in your joints as well. But... It can be in a rare case that you don't have any general uh, general symptoms. Only the bull's eyes rash and no symptom. It's it's rare, but it can be. So once the bull's eyes there, or even if it's not there, once you have the Lyme disease, is it really as simple as thirty days of antibiotics and you're fine? If you get surgery, you are already lucky because normally <laughs> it's ten to twenty one, which is in the recommendations for the doctors. It's definitely too short because if you take in consideration that Borrelia, the spiral heat, divides itself between twelve to twenty four hours, it's a very very slow replication rate. In contrary, E. coli, Escherichia coli, yeah. then it's only twenty minutes to replicate. So that means that you need for treating a E. coli disease maybe four to five days, but for the Lyme germ like Borrelia, you need at least 30 days. So for the first 30 days will be enough if you just have a simple infection, if you don't have any co-infections or any other conditions which make it more likely that you get chronic. So for the chronic ones, then you wouldn't be necessarily just taking a simple antibiotic. There'd be more to the treatment than just a simple antibiotic. If you're a chronic case, you have reasons for being chronic. And these reasons have to be found out individual. Every person has a certain set of reasons, like amalgam fillings, which are very bad because of the mercury in it. The immune system has to deal with mercury itself. So it's always occupied already with mercury and has not much uh, energy left, more or less, for Lyme germs, which are the spirochetes. And another reason could be toxins from the surrounding or pesticides or chemicals in any way, like uh, disinfectants or many, many other reasons for getting chronic because you have a compromised uh, immune system. 
So one of the tricks, I guess, would be keep your immune system strong. Well, that's easy said, but it's not so clear. <laughs> but of course, living healthy is always a good pre precaution. It's a good precaution for just about everything, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so the tick doesn't really bite, does it? It's a sting. And then it vomits. It's sort of a secretion into your skin that also has a bit of an analgesic. So sometimes you don't feel the tick bite or most times you don't feel the tick bite. And it's the size of the period at the end of a sentence in a book or a poppy seed. Yeah, that's correct. So it's always not uh, that you can feel it when you get stung because it's really, it has an anesthetic in its saliva and it is a stinger, a stinger. So never say a tick bite. Actually, it's wrong because you uh, never get bitten because there's no mouth, there's no teeth, there's not even a head. Okay. So not eyes, because they feel with their legs, with their front legs. There is a so-called Haller's organ, which is uh, able to detect um, CO2 mm -hmm. in the first place and vibrations. So if an animal or even a human uh, comes closer, the tick realizes it with a Haller's organ in its front legs. And if this uh, host is close enough, then it grabs the host and it's immediately fixed on the on the host's body. Yuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's a way of nature. <laughs> it certainly is. And then it stings you with this snout kind of thing. It's like it's, a stinger. It's called hypostome. It's a stinger, yeah. And it's it, it's like a like a saw kind of yes a saw kind of stinger mm -hmm. so it goes deep into your skin and then after a while even it has uh, it's secreting some kind of cement mm -hmm. so it's even fixed more fixed so when it's um, engorged on a on a host's body after let's say a few hours you can't take it out easily anymore because it's so fixed in into you wow and that's necessary because it's can be on the host's body for more than 10 days. So it's really engorged and takes its time to suck your blood because it sucks the blood and it uh, retains only the erythrocytes and the serum goes back to the host. And with the serum, which goes back, it's really like um, vomiting. It vomits all the Borrelia, which come out the, from the midgut of the tick into the host. And then the whole story starts. And if you get just uh, stung on a skin area, the skin will react. But if the, the sting went directly into a little artery, then it is dissolved within minutes in the whole body because it goes with the bloodstream through the whole body. So that could cause a quicker... Then you, you become quicker ill than if you just... Uh, a skin reaction which takes some time to to develop and then after a while you get the infection of the whole body. So the dissemination is it called. Mm -hmm. So the dissemination is a lot quicker depending on where the tick bites you. Correct. That's correct, yeah. So just in basic terms, people should really check themselves when they come in from a walk in the forest just to make sure. And one of the big tricks I've heard is that you wear light clothes because the tick is a dark color. So it's easier to spot a tick on light clothing than it is on dark clothing. Mm, yes, but don't trust too much on these little differences <laughs> because the real tick, the tick which is infecting most people is the young nymph. And the young nymph is not really dark. The adult is a dark one. Oh, it has okay. a, a red back mm -hmm. and a, a black front part. And the male is totally black, which is harmless. The male tick is harmless. It never gives you an infection because it's not transmitting blood in the adult stage because it only the female sucks blood to get ready for laying eggs. And eggs means a few thousands. So every tick lays a few thousands eggs. And after a really short time, they crawl away. They're already larvae. So, so they can crawl on their six legs. They have six, six legs and they crawl away from mum and thousands of them from one tick. So you can imagine how many are really replicated and it's a terrible cycle of, of yeah, 
too many around. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Do birds eat ticks? I, I mean, like, what would kill a tick? Maybe a bird. Maybe no. birds eat ticks. Oh, no, oh, no. There's no natural killer. It's only one thing so far known, which is a bee. A bee who stinks herself into the tick and lays her eggs in the tick itself. When the little um, bee eggs develop, the tick bursts. It's dying. But that's the only known cause for some animal who is able to kill ticks. Now, ticks have been around for a long time. Some people believe that the strain of ticks that are now infecting up into Ontario came from Plum Island in New York with two different kinds of bacteria in them. But ticks in general have been around for thousands of years. Is yes. that true? That's correct, yes. They even found in Ötzi, the Iceman from Germany or Austria, um, Borrelia strains in his bone marrow, which is very unusual, of course, because we normally don't have it in the bone marrow, but they had it already. So it must have been in, in him for many, many years. And he was thousands of years old, like 50,000 years old. <laughs> 50,000 years ago, yes, right. <laughs> okay, so we've been dealing with Borrelia, know it or not, for a very long time. Yes, that's true. And it was always, if you talk to elder people, they will tell you, I have a, had a lot of ticks in my youth and I took them away. And, it, and that was it. So nobody really felt so often ill like nowadays. This might have been caused by this Plum Island uh, experiments for biological warfare. So this is something we know. It's not very well published because it's a real a touchy issue. Okay, but would that account for the ticks that are in Europe? Would they have somehow crossed the ocean or are the ticks in Europe a different breed again? Yes, in Europe we have much more. No, the ticks are always the same. It's called ticks. As a tick in Europe is called Ixodes rhizinus, which is the normal tick transmitting. You have two different types of ticks over here, but the ticks are only transmitting. The real cause for getting ill is Borrelia, and we have seven different types so far, which we know are pathogenic to humans. Mm -hmm. So they make humans ill. But there are many others which make several uh, special uh, type of animals ill. So there are a, a, wi a wide variety of different kind of Borrelia, and even Borrelia recurrentis, which is another disease, mm -hmm. uh, is a type of spirochete. Borrelias are spirochetes like Treponema pallidum, which is a spirochete which causes syphilis. So syphilis and late Lyme disease has a lot in common in symptoms and development of the disease. And both can be treated with antibiotics. Sure. But it takes a long time to treat them when, they are, when you're chronic. Mm -hmm. But in contrary, when you are freshly infected, it only takes you 30 days to be quite sure that you can make it. Fresh, fresh. You're listening to Fresh on Whistle FM, Stouffville's own community radio station at 102.9 FM in Stouffville and whistlefm.com on the internet and on your smartphone. Today we're speaking with Dr. Petra Hofseidel, a German neurologist who specializes in Lyme disease. We'll be talking ticks and Lyme disease today on Fresh. If you'd like to comment or share a story, you can contact us on our Facebook page, whistlefm fresh Now back to Dr. Hofseidel discussing ticks and Lyme. So is it true then that some ticks don't carry the Borrelia? Oh, yes, that's true, because only 30% in Europe and 30% over here have Borrelia in their midgut. So that means if you have a tick, you should test it immediately if it's bearing Borrelia or not. Here, you send it away and you get it back after eight weeks. Though this is much too long to to start the treatment. You have to start treatment immediately after you got, get bitten. So there is one test that you can use to self-diagnose whether or not you think you have Lyme disease. No, 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 no. No? No. <laughs> the test is just to test if the tick contains Borrelia or not. You uh -huh. crash the tick and you put some liquid in a little tube and then it, it's like if you test for pregnancy, you get a color back if it's containing Borrelia or not. If this test is reliable, it's under uh, control at the moment. They are not quite sure if it's really so reliable as the production firm says. Well, that's interesting. 
So you'd have to catch the tick. Sure, always. You <laughs> never should throw it away because you have to know if it's containing Borrelia or not. So the best way is doing a first self-testing uh, if you have it available because in Canada it takes eight weeks to get a result and that's definitely too long. Hmm. Our laboratories, we can send it to different laboratories in Germany and you get it within two days. That is good enough to start a treatment after infection. So Canada has some work to do to bring up their standards of their testing. Yes, I've heard that the local health units are working on that to test them. That would be good. That would be great, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's talk about the Borrelia then. So you get stung by a tick and the Borrelia enters your system and it goes through your bloodstream to wherever it wants to go? Yes, to every organ, every tissue, every cell. It can go into erythrocytes and granulocytes, the cells of the blood, or they go to tendons and joints and brain and wherever. So all the symptoms can, which uh, erupt later on can be caused by Borrelia because they can be in every corner of your body. That makes it so difficult to recognize because you have a tons of symptoms which could be, not everybody has everything, of course, but it's such a variety that it is difficult to recognize it. So that would, if you're talking about it getting into your joints and your tendons, this would give you the muscle aches that people often complain about. And when it gets into your head, that gives you the headaches that people complain about. Are these things reversible once you get rid of the bor Borrelia? Yes, most of it is reversible if you catch it early enough. It's always a matter of when you start to treat. When you start to treat only when you are already chronic since years, then it's much more difficult, of course. But it's still possible. And it seems like these Borrelia are quite smart. They're, they're <laughs> tiny microscopic things and they're spiral looking, but they're smart. They go where the immune system is weakest. Yes, because there's no vascularization. And that makes it easy for the Borrelia to hide because the immune system comes with the blood. Uh -huh. it, it is part of the blood, of course. Right. And so if there's no blood around, then they are in a safe place. But not only that, they can change to look like the host tissue itself. They change their surface and then they are like the host itself. So the immune system will not recognize it as, as foreign, as strange. That sounds really smart. That's scary smart. It's almost like a little <laughs> a little invasion of some sort of alien. Right. <laughs> yeah, it is, but they are very successful. They have had time so many thousand years to adapt to this, to survive. They know how to survive in a body. And are there people who have Borrelia but no symptoms? There are people, of course, because in statistical figures, it's nine out of 10 who handle the infection with their own immune system so they don't develop any symptoms afterwards. But they that needs to have a healthy immune system, healthy food, healthy diet, as you call it, and uh, no additional disease already prevalent. So if you have something already going on or you get immune suppressant uh, drugs for any disease you got, then you are more prone to it. And the worst part on, of this is if you are suspected to have uh, multiple sclerosis, MS, and the symptoms are sometimes quite similar to chronic Lyme disease symptoms, and if they don't recognize it as Lyme and they give you cortisone, then it's really terrible because you deteriorate a lot as a Lyme disease patient. But that would be a misdiagnosis. So someone thinks it's MS-like symptoms, they treat for the MS, yeah. and then the drug for the MS actually is really bad if you have Lyme disease. That's correct. That's really a disaster. And sometimes it's really happen happening in a stage where it's like a real junction. If you go to the right side where the MS treatment waits for you, or if you go to the left side where uh, antibiotics should be given. And I guess that would come down to some sort of a diagnosis. People have to start looking for Lyme disease. Yes, it should be on a general practitioner level done with every unclear symptom which prevails for a while, mm -hmm. not just within a week. But if it's for, let's say, a few weeks and it's not explainable by another disease or another cause you, you get to know, then you always should think of Lyme disease. What would make it much easier to, to detect all these undetected cases? 
Is it just a simple blood test of some kind? Well, it's not simple, but it is a blood test. It's a... Uh, there are different stages. So the first stage is always to search and look for antibodies against Borrelia. That's the easy part. But in your country, your antibody system is not good because they don't catch every antibody which could be detected. So the next part or the next step is a immunoblot or Western blot, which means that you are looking for special bands. So if you have specialized, highly specialized bands, which are only um, created by Borrelia in your body, then you know that the bug is there. And the third stage you don't have available over here, it measures the activity of, of the disease, which is done by a so-called lymphocytes transformation test. LTT is the abbreviation, and this is not possible here. And you can't send it over to Germany because it has to be in the lab within 24 hours. So that makes it impossible for Canadians to get this test done. Is there a place in the States maybe that you can get that test done? No, not even in the States. But in the States, there is an, a laboratory who at least uh, tests for ma more antibodies. Well, it's Igenix in Palo Alto in California. They have the best uh, testing system in North America. That's good to know. That's a possibility then for some people who are really wanting to know. Yeah, because it's not cheap, of course. No. But and does that have to be done in 24 hours, or do you no, have a little longer on that one? No, they are only searching for the antibodies they take. They, you can send in a normal post uh, a mailing system because you don't have to do it in a hurry. So if a person's being proactive and they suspect that they've been stung, stung Fine. by a tick, there are the measures that we just mentioned that you can take. If you think that years ago you were stung and that you have had symptoms over the years mm -hmm. and an unclear diagnosis so far. Are there other resources here that we can look at to try and do some more educating of ourselves on Lyme disease? It, I don't like to send people to the internet because the internet has all kinds of things and you get so caught up in maybe unreliable sources, but there are some reliable sources in Canada, are there not? One of them being your website. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my website, but it's not so much in English. It's always in English. But there is there's an English movie which explains a lot that could be looked up. And then you have Ken Lyme, which is the support group of Canada for all Lyme disease sufferers. And I would recommend Helke Ferry and her book Ending Denial, which has a lot of information about the disease and the politics around it. Mm -hmm. And the politics are actually kind of scary. But... As long as we create more awareness, the politics will have to stand up and be accountable to the people who are interested in finding more about this disease, because it can be a horrible disease. There are people who are debilitated from this disease. Oh, yes, many also are, because if you're always tired and have pain, you are not functioning anymore, neither socially nor in your professional work. So you are really sometimes outcast after a short while and, and without any money. Because after a while, the health system will not pay you anymore. I mean, in Germany. Mm -hmm. I don't know about here. Well, it seems to be that's kind of the case everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then families suffer, and it's not a good thing. No, it affects the whole family. Because if someone is really feeling ill all the time and nobody knows what it is, it's very quick said that it might be between your ears. So you land on the psychological uh, side of the things and this is truly not the right way to to deal with it i mean it is clear too that you get a, a depressive uh, mood after a while when you're always ill and having pain that's a normal uh, reaction but it is not caused because you are psycholo you have psychological problems that's a big difference Fresh. You're listening to Fresh on Whistle FM, Stouffville's own community radio station at 102.9 FM in Stouffville and whistlefm.com on the internet and on your smartphone. Today we're speaking with Dr. Petra Hofseidel, a German neurologist who specializes in Lyme disease. We'll be talking ticks and Lyme disease today on Fresh. If you'd like to comment or share a story, you can contact us on our Facebook page, Whistle FM dash Fresh. Now back to Dr. Hofseidel discussing ticks and Lyme. 
Some people say that Lyme disease has MS-like symptoms. I've also heard it said that it has Alzheimer's-like symptoms. As a neurologist, how do you respond to that? That's true. I mean, if you take the symptoms like short-term memory problems or um, problems in concentration, in reading, in s even speaking, because sometimes you don't speak what you want to say. So it's for the others, it, it looks like Alzheimer's. And if you're a little bit older, then you are very quick treated for Alzheimer's. But if you treat it well, and then you reverse all these uh, deficiencies, and then out of a sudden you are not having any any sign of Alzheimer anymore. You know, there was an, a famous man over here, a singer, Chris Christopherson, a, a singer, yeah, a singer. He had a, a diagnosis of Alzheimer, and finally his wife found out that he got a dick bite uh, any time before, and so they followed up the Lyme disease uh, diagnosis, and it turned out to be right. Wow, because that would be a lot easier to treat than Alzheimer's. <laughs> Surely. <laughs> it's, a, it's a treatment which is causal, causative. Right. But if you treat Alzheimer's, it's not causal, it's just symptomatic. Would there, the symptoms be able to be reversed? Would the short-term memory come back? Sure, would the sure. would the speech come back and all of those side effects? Sure, sure. That's a sign of your recovery. That's for sure, yeah. So does the Borrelia do permanent damage to certain organs or, or joints? Permanent damage, it's a matter of, of time. If, it's, if you are having Lyme disease for a long time, then you get damage, of course. But if you catch it in an early stage, you don't. So it's depending on the time, how long you are dealing with this bug. Well, I guess then it makes a lot of sense for everybody to be a little bit vigilant. We're not trying to scare anyone. We're just saying be vigilant. Take sure. a look when you come back from a walk. Sure. Take a look. Take a look and look for your children especially. Look them up every day after playing outside. And be careful with uh, animals in your house like dogs and cats who carry from outside the ticks in the house. And if they have it in their skin in their hairy skin mm -hmm. <laughs> and it falls on the let's say on the couch or so if this little nymphs fall on the couch and are staying there and the next person is sitting there and then they crawl all over to the child or whoever is sitting there and then it whole story starts again wow <laughs> <laughs> now deer often are the culprit for trends furring them to different places the ticks right. They, they get on the deer, then the deer rubs against a bush, then you rub against that bush, and no. you, you have the tick. <laughs> no, if, no, no, no. If the, if the deer rub against the bush, then it falls on the ground. Okay. And then you walk along, and then you can catch it. You don't rub on a bush okay. <laughs> to so get the tick. <laughs> oh, you could if the tick's just hanging out there. No, they don't. They that's, don't. A, that's another wrong story. No, no. Okay. They always crawl up from the ground to the maximum height of one meter and 20 centimeters. That's the maximum they can reach. So they're really on bushes, not on trees. But the deer doesn't get sick. That's correct. Like any, some other animals like cows don't get sick and uh, goats don't get sick. So there are a, a few animals who have Borrelia in their system, but they don't fall ill. And it's a mystery so far why. And this should be scientifically uh, investigated and researched as well. What about birds? They don't get ticks either, do they? Well, they get the ticks, but they don't get disease. I can't tell you because I don't know how they feel if they have, if they have Lyme disease as a bird. I don't know. <laughs> but they are transmitters, that's for sure. And, and about uh, um, over long distances. So birds are bringing in from U.S. They were the first to bring in from U.S. the ticks to Can Canada. It came with migrating birds, migratory birds. Wow. Okay. Dogs do get ticks and can be affected by Lyme disease. But horses, very much. Cats as well. So they are really ill. But we have things that prevent them getting ill on dogs and cats and horses. I give my dogs some sort of little... DD. Just the idea you are giving. Nothing special. No, no. We don't have anything to prevent the disease. It's only the immune system who can prevent it, more or less. There is nothing from outside you can give to prevent the disease. Not so, not yet. Okay. 
So that's, I guess, one of the preventions is to wear bug spray. Yeah, but they are not much impressed by bug spray. <laughs> no, well, and the bug spray only lasts you for four hours. So it's not, and, and DED, it's not the healthiest thing you can apply to yourself. So be careful with that. Mm. It's not really effective. It's eff more effective if you cut your grass really short, as the Canadians always do. It's a Canadian religion to cut the grass every second week or every week. So that's a good uh, precaution. And uh, another thing is uh, that you always look up if you have a tick on your body and look up in spots where the skin is thin, like the knee, the back of the knee, the elbow, uh, bit, mm -hmm. the armpit, or between the buttock, these are, mm -hmm. or in the uh, genital region, they really search for so soft and a little bit um, wet areas. And the back of the neck, I've heard, is a popular spot. Too. Oh yeah, especially for children, because it's of, because of the height of the children. They are, let's say, one, one meter and a little bit more, and though they, if they go through the bushes, and they get it easily. Hmm. And so the good thing about kids, though, is usually the parents are helping them bathe and things. So the parent might be able to see the tick or the bite. They have to search for because it's very often behind the ears or under the hair where the hair starts. So you don't if you if girls have long hair, you have to take it up and to look up. Mm -hmm. So you have to be aware of it. You don't do it immediately because you see it. You have to search for so is there a lot of research in Europe right now going on about ticks? Not enough. There is some, but not enough. It's always a problem because it's not recognized as a spreading and epidemic disease as it is. So we have to do some more research here. Canada seems to be a little bit behind the eight ball in getting the research that we need and, and the attention that we need to Lyme disease. Well, especially the attention. I mean, there is a lot of research out here especially by um, entomologists and basic researchers, but not the doctors so far. That's a problem. The doctors don't deal enough with this disease. They don't get enough uh, experiences treating people who are really ill with Lyme disease for a long time. So if if you take hospital doctors, they see the acute cases, maybe even the neuroborreliosis like Lyme disease with neurological symptoms, they see them, they treat them with some good antibiotic and then they discharge them and after a while these people don't get a relapse and they don't see the doctor anymore and the doctor will not get to know that there was a relapse and that the uh, chronic um, form develops after a while. I, I've heard of someone here who was suspected of having Lyme disease and they went on amoxicillin for I don't know 21 days but that's not going to work is it? No, that's the wrong drug because amoxicillin is just for pregnant women because they can't take anything else. But for a normal person, child or adult, there are different other drugs which has to be taken. And it, it has to be a drug which goes in the cells. So intracellular drug is necessary. And amoxicillin only works outside the cell. So it will not catch the Borrelia which is in the cells. That is one of the tricks of the of the spirochetes that they change their forms. So spirochetal form is just the beginning. After a few days, there are granula, which means little uh, round um, balls, mm -hmm. and they are still the same, but they change the form. And with granula, antibiotics have to go into the cells to 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 address them, and they are cystic forms and there are even biofilms which is the most difficult to treat because a biofilm is a colony of spirochetes which builds a ball with a, a shield of, of gelatin yeah. and um, so they are not uh, approachable anymore by the immune system because they are totally disappeared. Wow. It's crazy and, and we don't have any drug so far to treat these biofilms and the biofilms are not only uh, created by Borrelia there are many germs who create biofilms, which makes chronic causes of many diseases, like urinary tract infections are often caused by these biofilms, or uh, pulmonary uh, infections, chronic form, are caused by biofilms. So this is another very neglected part of, of the disease that they don't even recognize 
that they are different living forms of this germ. And the easiest form to treat is the spirochetal form, the mm -hmm. first. But if they are in the cells with all these hidden or round body forms, they are much more difficult to get and to, to de be destroyed than with, with the spirochetal form. So this calls for early treatment as well. Now, diagnosis for a chronic case is a bit tricky because, as we mentioned, there's so many different symptoms that make up a a person's profile for mm -hmm. chronic disease. So are there ways, are there diagnostics available to try and pinpoint Lyme in those cases? Yes and no. There are forms, if you take the medical history, you have always to take into account was there a tick bite in the previous years or not? Was there any reaction on the skin? Yes or no? Both can be. And how how was the life of this um, person afterwards? How uh, which which kind of symptoms did did she or he develop? And is it fitting in the picture of a Lyme disease uh, infection? There are certain things which are more common than others. So you have to know the symptoms quite well of Lyme disease, so you can figure out this could be a case of Lyme disease or not. And yes, there are some other um, ways to detect it, but they are not recognized in the medical community, like applied kinesiology. With this method, method you can see if there is a Borrelia germ in the body of the patient or not. Mm -hmm. But this is um, not a medical acknowledged method. So there's a lot to be done in the study of Lyme disease. Yes, still. And there are so many questions open. And it's only a pity that only a few feel the urge to, to work with this disease. Mostly when I get patients, they tell me, my doctor doesn't want to deal with me anymore because I'm sus I suspect I have Lyme disease. <laughs> so they are always sending them away because they don't want to deal with it. And that's interesting because you think that on a scientific level, everybody would be really interested in this because there are so many people potentially affected. That's correct. And I mean, it's a very interesting uh, bug in, in many ways. And the, pa the patients are so grateful if they get rid of some of the symptoms and, and get better. And, and all this is very rewarding for a doctor, but it is a, a long way to come to the knowledge of Lyme disease you need. So you have to do a lot of extra studies, but you are not knowing it from the textbooks because they don't tell you. The textbooks are very basic. They just know three symptoms, which is arthritis, mostly the knees, which is maybe tiredness, if they recognize it as a symptom, and maybe neurological deficits like uh, um, palsy, pulse palsy, but there's only a, a few of so many. So if you don't know more, then you can't deal with this disease. It is fascinating. I know a lot of doctors and a lot of people are reluctant to go on long-term antibiotics. Oddly enough, the tetracycline drugs that work well on Lyme disease, people used to take them for acne, and they didn't have a problem going on long-term right. antibiotics for acne. Yeah. But they seem to have a problem going on long-term antibiotics for Lyme. It doesn't make much sense. No, it doesn't make much sense. <laughs> Uh, even so, you need a higher dosage, of course, for Lyme disease. But, I mean, it's how to say it. For the cosmetic or for the well-being and looking nice, you do everything, but not for a bug, for a ugly bug, which is into your body. Into your body causing big problems. Oh, yes. And, you, well, the patient himself sometimes don't recognize how ill he is. He only feels it afterward when he's clear of the symptoms. It's like a person who gets sleep, but who doesn't normally sleep. When they do get sleep, they are so relieved. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that this is one of the early symptoms which go away. If you are sleepless and have sleep disorder with awakening at night and having, for example, panic attacks at night, which are not panic, it's, it's caused by the Borrelia. So many things can look like something different and it isn't or heart rate irregularities, you go to the cardiologist and he can't find anything, but you have it because Lyme can make it in periods. So you get periods of arrhythmia and, and tachycardia, and afterwards, if you take an ECG, nothing can be seen. 
that's a problem for the doctor and the patient, of course. For both, I would assume. Yeah. Fresh, fresh. You're listening to Fresh on Whistle FM, Stouffville's own community radio station at 102.9 FM in Stouffville and whistlefm.com on the internet and on your smartphone. Today we're speaking with Dr. Petra Hofseidel, a German neurologist who specializes in Lyme disease. We'll be talking ticks and Lyme disease today on Fresh. If you'd like to comment or share a story, you can contact us on our Facebook page, whistlefm-fresh. Now back to Dr. Hofseidel discussing ticks and Lyme. It's absolutely wonderful that we have the opportunity to speak with you and to get this new insight into understanding Lyme disease. I think that's one of the keys to this kind of thing is understanding. And it's not a lost cause. If you get bitten by a tick, your life isn't over, but you do have to pay attention. That's right. That's the most important thing that you are aware that you know what to do and that you do it. So not don't be neglectant because it can become a real disaster when you don't react in the early stage. Okay. So when someone says, oh, I have a bullseye, but that doesn't necessarily mean I have Lyme disease. I'm just going to leave it until I start feeling bad. That's not a good attitude to take. Surely not. And it's a little bit stupid because if you have the, uh, the chance to see that you are infected and bullseye rash is a, one of the only few definite signs of it, then you immediately have to treat it. It goes away even without treatment. That's true. The bullseye's rash always goes off after a while. But just that means if you don't treat it, that you allow the, the enemy to stay on in your body. And to multiply, even though he's multiplying slowly. But steadily. The Borrelia <laughs> is still multiplying and doing yeah. damage. Oh, yes, a lot of damage. I mean, you can imagine being in every organ it can be sometimes only elevated liver enzymes Enzymes is a sign of Lyme disease. If you have elevated liver enzymes, I had a patient just yesterday who told me I have over years elevated liver enzymes and I'm not drinking. And that's true. But still, they don't know the reason because they don't think of Lyme disease. So this is just one symptom. I mean, that can be very, very tricky to find out what all is belonging to the disease, what kind of symptoms of this person belong to the disease, and there are sometimes very, very many. Well, we're going to put some of your references on our website mm -hmm. and on our Facebook page. Oh, so if you go to um, whistlefm-fresh, you will find our webpage, and on there, Jason Rumball, our handy-dandy tech guy, will put up the website for CanLime and your website and Helka Ferry's website. And through those websites, you can get to all kinds of different resources that talk about Lyme disease. Yeah. It can be a little scary when you first start researching Lyme. Yes, but you have to have a clear view what you want. I mean, if you want to, to get the information what you have to do and how to do it, and then you have to go through a certain period of antibiotic treatment, and then if you feel better, you know it was the right way. Okay. And if you have a chronic case, sometimes the one treatment of antibiotic isn't enough. I know Dr. Horowitz in New York uses one antibiotic and another couple of drugs to try and get people out of the chronic illness mm -hmm. of Lyme. Yes, that's a way. But you have to know what you give very clearly. I mean, don't experiment with drugs which are in the first place not able to treat this kind of disease. So there are too many in the recommendation which are really not helpful, like all kind of penicillin, mm -hmm. which is not helpful. And if you take ceftriaxone, it's the same. It's a kind of penicillin or it's a derivative of penicillin, and it only works in the very early stage. And if you get it later on, it's okay for the inflammatory part of the disease because all Lyme disease patients have a chronic inflammatory inflammatory uh, reaction. So the ceftriaxone helps against the inflammation, but it doesn't help to kill and to destroy the Borrelia in the cells because it doesn't go into the cells. It's only working extracellular. So this has to be taken in, in mind and if you get a, a proposal for let's say, rocephine treatment IV for 21 days. It works in the first place. 
in the early stage, but not when you have it had for months already. Good stuff to know. That's mm. really good to know. <laughs> yeah. Because we have to be advocates for ourselves too yes. sometimes yeah. in the medical world, don't we? Yeah, in this especially in this kind of disease, you really have to know as a patient more sometimes than the doctor because you have the time to go into details the doctor sometimes don't have the time. So don't be too uh, crappy with your doctor if he doesn't know everything you know already by the internet. But you have to come to a communication and, and exchange of views and to find your way with your doctor to, to get treated. That's good advice. Because I think the doctors do want to work with you in the end. And sometimes sure. if you've got some information that they may not have, then this is a good thing. It seems like the key to going further with Lyme disease and is to have more education about it. That's for sure. That's why we are sitting here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad about the chance to talk about it because I, I've have talked to so many Canadians who have no idea or little idea about tick bite and and all the consequences which are afterwards to expect. So it's good that we can give out some more information. And as you mentioned, this literature, that's a good way. You have always to go for trustworthy uh, sources. Otherwise, you get too much crappish. There's a lot of stuff on the internet that's not worth reading and it's not yeah. credible. So it's good or to it's know a, what credible information yeah. is out there. Or if it's coming from a production firm from a, for anything, it's always a little bit announcement and advertisement. Mm -hmm. It's not only information, it's advertisement sometimes. And so you have to get to know what, what source you are reading. I actually read an article recently where they said the natural cure for Lyme disease. If you don't want antibiotics, you can do natural ways to cure Lyme disease. And from what I've read, that's rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you try it only with homeopathic or natural sources, it's very unsecure. I mean, if you have a healthy immune system, you might be lucky and it might be enough. But if you are a normal person with some diseases in your medical history already, it's a little bit uh, a little bit scary to do it just with natural sources. It's helping. I'm, I'm uh, prescribing a lot of natural things additional, of course, like glutathione, which is very important to get because it is a source of energy or carnitine or... There are many things. And in one of my articles about chronic Lyme disease, which you are um, referring to, I'm giving some more detailed information about it. So it is worthwhile to, to add it to the antibiotic, but not to have it alone. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you for talking to us today. This has been fascinating. And I hope that it inspires some people to be a little more diligent when it comes to ticks and Lyme disease. And as long as we can start educating people, then eventually the medical profession and, and research will come together. And I think we're going to find some great leaps and bounds in the next few years about Lyme disease. Thank you for the opportunity to talk and have a nice day. <laughs> Thanks very much. We've been talking with Dr. Petra Hofseidel about Lyme disease and tick stings. We're going to start calling them stings instead of bites. And we will refer you to their website and all of the information that we can find on the different websites. And that's Fresh for this week. Thanks for listening. Fresh, Fresh. Thank you for tuning in to Fresh. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Tune in each Wednesday at 10 a.m. on Whistle FM, 102.9 in Stouffville, and whistlefm.com, anywhere where you have a connection to the Internet. Until next time, this is Brenda and Jay signing off. Have a fabulous, fresh day.